Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Hamilton, State Librarian of Louisiana. Welcome to the 10th annual Just Listen to Yourself, the Louisiana Poet Laureate Presents Louisiana Poets, hosted by John Warner Smith, Poet Laureate of Louisiana. John has published four collections of poetry, and his fifth collection will be released this year. He earned his MFA at the University of New Orleans and is a fellow of Cave Canon. He is also the winner of the 2019 Linda Hodge Bromberg Poetry Award. And for this program, John has brought together an extraordinary group of poets that collectively will stir your emotions, create vivid imagery of places you might like to go, and perhaps even challenge your perspective and they will leave you feeling connected and satisfied at a time when we all need that. We are so pleased to be able to present this program to you, even if we can't all be together. But for us, canceling was never an option. At the end of March, when the State Library was forced to make some tough decisions on whether or not to cancel critical programming, the Center for the Book staff, along with all of the State Library staff, said to me, we don't want to cancel anything. Let's try to host events virtually. And so we have. I could not be more proud of their efforts to ensure that Louisiana citizens continue to have the resources that they need even more during a pandemic. Hello, everyone. I'm John Warner Smith, the current Port Laureate of Louisiana. It is my distinct privilege and pleasure to present Just Listen to Yourself, an annual reading by some of Louisiana's most talented poets, held every April in celebration of National Poetry Month. We'd like to thank the Louisiana Center for the Book and the State Library of Louisiana for hosting and coordinating the event. Because of the pandemic, we are holding the event virtually for the first time. So let's begin. Liz Adair received her BA in English from the University of Alabama in 2016. Currently, she serves as the managing editor of the Magnese Review and organizes MSU's graduate reading series. She is the first place recipient of the 2019 George Scantleberry Poetry Prize and her poems have been selected as finalists for a Jabberwock Review's 2019 Nancy D. Hargrave Editor's Prize in Poetry and Friction's Winter 2018 Poetry Contest, judged by Kwame Dawes. She currently lives in Lake Charles, Louisiana with her very cute dog, Rocky. I'm Liz Adair and I'm a third year poet at McNeese. I'm going to be reading a few poems from my thesis, More Than Cave or Hollow. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is called Gutting Fish, um, and I think it says it all in the title, really. Uh, Dad says I should have been born a catfish, because every day for nine months, Mom ate the mud burrowers, simmered in catfish head stew. Dad grits his teeth when he's mad, and so do I. We chew gum the same smacking way, and I learn from him to straighten and grin. When hooks and breaking hands come to drag me toothless from the river, Dad tells me, be stubborn as a fish, refuse to die. I'm slippery and moss-backed, yearning to swim through every patch of moss. Dad calls me shovel-headed mud cat and teaches me how to dip a bush hook off Seven Mile Island. He says fishing is the same as life, Kindness is a mercy. Lines of blood swim in water. When I kill my first, I gut it living because it tastes better, because the fish can't feel it anyway. Dad holds the slipping body still. I set a steel black nail above one wild roving eye and drive it through. The scales sever and stretch. Muscles jerk against Dad's hands. The fishy eye bulges from the hard metal pressure and blots red. I try to think of orange sunsets and tiny shredded tangerines. I imagine the wet screech of metal meeting spine is something else. 
perhaps a soft chop to the green stem of a red orchid. We eat the fish body for dinner, but leave the head on a shelf in the garage until the skin puckers like cockled paper. I like to stare at him. For hours, I study the pearl eyes, pulled forward by time, nearly to the empty space where a human nose is missing. I learn to count by the fish's bald spots. I hide lucky pennies in the bulge of lower lip until it crumbles and falls to fangless snarl. Later, when strong, limitless hands fish me from my river in tatters to clean the guts from my jerking, breathless body, I think of grinning catfish and bare my teeth. Um, all right, the next poem is uh, After Katie's Dad Died, uh, which is just about an experience I had as a kid growing up in Alabama. After Katie's Dad Died, Summer came and her body caved to chlorine and adolescence with cutting grace. Wire limbs moved like weeds in water. Her short face puckered up at the end into shorter nose, smirked like a mouth, round, lemur eyes a deep clear blue, teeming with specks of silver. And yellow, minuscule metallic bits sunk in evaporating spring ponds. Not aggrieved but serene, she would flip and twist above us, showing off on the highest rung of our pyramid, beyond reach of our unripe hands. We gazed with hunger up at her perch, wanting to steal death from her, to wrap ourselves in the air of her grief, to play dress up in her new adult skin. We thought she had become too grown up for the steel top of our jungle gym, and our flittering girlish bodies bulged and bungling rims beneath her, buzzing mosquito-like in our jealousy, wild-eyed and tied to pink purses, sprouting plastic wings. Our glittering barrettes shimmered like a million hungry eyes in the dark. Um, the next poem is about my time um, dealing with chronic illness. So I'm writing about uh, being in the ER, undergoing a uh, serious health event and uh, trying to make it a little less monstrous than it is by making it more monstrous. Um, so, Dragon in the ER. Seven years I beg men in white to make a clock of my insides, to build for me a patient body, a human one with moonflowers for eyes. The doctors say rage is not a flower. They tell me to eat, soft and bland for healing. So I suckle honeysuckle sap for pleasure and steam sunset marigolds for distraction as the sleepless itch for power swells beyond my belly button. I sob when my skin first begins to sting and brittle. My fine baby hair sharpened into needle horns while I call, sing and plead, staring through dull hospital glass at the bloody hyacinths bursting across the street. Please, I would rather bear fruit than fire, but my salt calls no army. I'm an echo in a cave. Flaming intestines sprouts from my belly, flares to fierce wing. My screams carry organ pipes to the desert and birth fields of wild red milkweed in the open mouths of dunes. Rage leathers my guts to mottled scale. I burn everything I touch and myself to shriveling pitless cherry. Reborn in brimstone, my golden glinting lizard hide straddles the canal and I hunger for bloom. Cloaked in silken gowns, heavy beneath heady magics, the men chant as a chorus back to me. No, no, no. Um, the next poem is also about uh, the same sort of situation, so talking about um, chronic health in a, in a different sort of way. Um, this one also reflects a lot um, on sort of missing places and uh, that feeling of loss. Um, easy as a chocolate shake. Everything is white and labeled blue for soiled or red for hazardous. And I'm sitting by myself, listening to a daughter comfort her mother on the other side of a baby blue curtain. An old woman says her stomach hurts, but my nurse tells me the woman is dying and doesn't know it yet. Another woman screams as she's escorted out. She says it's her right to exist, to be here. That she only wants to visit her father, and they won't let her, because he wants to die, without argument. 
The lady next to me has a feeding tube filled with chocolate shake and throat cancer. I don't have anyone to talk to or a chocolate shake. I wonder if I am dying and haven't realized it. Will I feel sleepy? Will I be alone in a white room when it happens? Will someone bring me a chocolate shake before I go? How many of the people who have touched my body would now? How many friends would wait patiently and worry? We all want it easy, love, touch, an easy life. Think of how much easier it would be without me to mess it up or argue with it or cry. I want easy too, in summer colors, Granny Smith green trees, chrysanthemums and day glow orange dahlias, honey glaze in an afternoon that moves easy like cream. I want a milkshake, Bluebell's Dutch chocolate from the Jacks near a lake almost 500 miles away. This next poem is um, also a part of the hospital series and it is uh, sort of the culmination of that series that reflects um, the literal of what's going on there in that during that time. So, uh, Collect Me. I've spent years trying to write about what it's like to shit blood every day, but really what's pretty in a laceration of poems about shitting too much. So I write about flowers instead, watching the sun's face like a storm eye the morning before surgery. My family packs into the white room with me and a nurse plucks the sun and sets it inside my room to blaze. She pulls the blinds open and points out a tree bursting outside our window. Bundled up in waves of summer, and I say in my benzo haze that the Japanese magnolia's fat pink blossoms look like exploding organs, but my family stares at them as though it's all an omen for growth with petals and seeds. Cut out the bad with the machete whack, the sun says. Its light blots out the window, pink and green, scalded, so the room whitens again. And I think about writing about dragons and women and flowers. And why do I always bring flowers into everything? Is it very feminine of me, trying to make this disease beautiful, wanting to be a flower instead? If I were a flower, then my colon would be a thorn or rotten brown petal for pruning. Right now I'm telling my doctor that rosebuds look like assholes, and I don't want one on my stomach. And if I were a garden of flowers, cutting out my colon would be a weeding. Afterward, I would be a half-cocked, a crooked stalk with wilting petals for teeth. But I would be better. I'm thinking that an exploding colon sounds like a joke that can't work. An ulcerative colitis sounds like a bleeding vine roped in red wounds. When really it is a disease that twines wreaths of poisonous sores with tissues that are also bleeding and leaking shit and also killing you. Shitting blood for six years can't be beautiful. I'm thinking about all this when they put me under and yank the evil out. I think of it and palm the magenta rosary you gave me, thinking I wish I knew how to pray. And I'm thinking of how to make shitting blood beautiful as I descend into head fog. And I'm thinking ulcerative colitis sounds like a name a scientist gives to a vine that has no beginning or end. Right, and uh, the last poem I'm going to read is uh, from the very end of my thesis. Um, this is the one that is supposed to hopefully take us out of the, uh, the tragic hospital stuff and into something a little bit new. Self-portrait as jackalope. I dreamed and my brainstem grew stiff branches, forking like wrapped roots out the back of my skull. I demanded the world be naked, that it stink, that it notice me, chase and challenge me, play with me, anything to stop the ache. Everything I found made the sprouting rougher. I longed to rub my stiff new hide against corners, to twist and shimmy and writhe until I could find others like me. I longed for caliche grass in the mountains in spring. My antlers reared to lock and buck, but I found, instead, soft bulbs decorating a crown. Strings of wildflowers twisted. Magenta golden seals murmured songs to me. Children bid me come and sleep. They tucked me in under window light. I was born to the limestone cliffs. I was made for blooming. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Katie Bickham's two books of poetry are Miles Open to Name Her, published in 2019, and The Bell Mar, published in 2015. Her poems have appeared in the Missouri Review, Rattle, 
Prairie Schooner, and elsewhere. She is the winner of the Rattle Reader's Choice Award, the Missouri Review Editor's Prize, and the Lena Miles Weber Todd Prize. Hi, this is Katie Bickham, and I'm so excited to be giving you a virtual poetry reading for National Poetry Month on behalf of Louisiana Poet Laureate John Warner Smith. And I really appreciate John organizing this uh, virtual uh, meeting of the minds. Uh, I'm going to share a few poems with you that to me are particular to uh, our current situation with COVID-19 and being sort of stuck at home. Um, so the first one I hope we will find to be an uplifting poem as I do. It's in my latest book, Mouths Open to Name Her, which you can get at any major book retailer. The Good News. Today, 350,000 babies will be born. Yesterday, they were all on their way, almost with us, not here yet, but today they will arrive, all of them, 350,000 of them in a single sleek rotation of the earth, alone and in pairs, screaming and silent, head first and feet first, they are coming. Another dozen every second, no matter how many forests we bulldoze or bullets we fire, they arrive and arrive like a laugh we can't stifle even at funerals or faculty meetings, a cup fuller each time we come for a drink. No matter how many barrels of oil we pump from the desert or dump in the ocean, how many units of blood we transfuse into soldiers, they arrive and arrive. The good news we can't wait to tell our buddies. The dog's tail thumping the carpet at five o'clock. Fish and loaves multiplying in the hands of Christ. Unstoppable, even after we push back from the table, full to bursting. And these are just humans. What glut of joy to count as well the millions of featherless birds bucking shells. Minnows clumsy in cold currents. Downy puppies with flat noses, or the lowly billion tomatoes taking root, acorns gaining purchase, moss doubling on a hundred-year-old trees, and the just as likely infants on triple distant moons orbiting planets we haven't named. But our home today, before you fall asleep, will be 350,000 babies richer 700,000 lungs louder, fanned by billions of brand new eyelashes. And if you're low, if you've watched too much news, or fallen out of love, or lost your keys, or your faith, or if all of the sunsets begin to look alike, just picture them all. 350,000 babies together at once, a city's worth of them in a row or a circle or wrapped in an acres wide blanket, an army of innocents yawning their first breaths over the globe and the promise that it will all happen again, just like this, just as imperfectly, no matter what, tomorrow. Um, I asked some friends before I did this video if they had any requests, because you don't often, as a poet, get requests like musicians do, uh, and they were game. So uh, this was one of the poems that was requested by one of my colleagues, and um, it's a poem called The Blades. This poem um, appeared first in the journal Rattle, and it ultimately won the Rattle Reader's Choice Award. Uh, which is a, one of my proudest accomplishments. Uh, and this ultimately is kind of my Me Too poem. The Blades. In the new world, as the goddess dictated, each time a man touched a woman against her will, each time he exposed himself, each time he whistled, dropped something in her drink, photographed her in secret, she sprouted a wing, from her spine, not feathered like birds or angels, not cellular, translucent, 
but veined like dragonflies, but a wing like a blade, like a sword hammered flat, thin as paper, one wing for wrong. At first the women lamented, all their dresses needed altering, their blankets shredded, their own hair sliced off like a whisper if it grew down their backs. And those misused by fathers, bosses, drunken strangers, evening after evening were blade-ridden, their statures curved downward like sorrow under such weight. But this was not the old world of red letters or mouthfuls of unspoken names, not the old world of women folded around their secrets like envelopes, of stark rooms where men asked what they'd done to deserve this. And the goddess whispered to the women in their dreams, and they awakened, startled, and knew the truth. They pinned up their hair, walked out into the morning, their blades glittering in the sun, sistering them to each other. They searched for the woman with the most blades, found her unable to stand, left for dead, nearly crushed beneath the blade's weight. They called her queen. They lifted her with hands gentle as questions, flung her into the air, saw her snap straight, beat the wings at last, and they followed her, a swarm of them, terrible and thrumming, to put the blades to use. The last poem that I wanted to share is a new poem. It's an unpublished poem, and it's uh, one of the only poems that I've been able to write since um, quarantine began, since I'm so often pretty constantly with my child and my husband, so that alone writing time isn't really happening for me right now, but I did manage to sneak away and uh, do a little reflecting on our situation right now, and so this is the poem that came from that. This is called Afterward. I want to wake up back home, to fall back blindly into a world of kissing, of water fountains being crushed by kindred bodies as a band drums out the songs we know by heart. I want to trip while running in the park, be helped up by a stranger, her fingers on my elbow, a mother's whisper. I want to catch an old man's roll before he knocks it off his table, stay while he eats it, and tells stories. I want to hold a day's old baby while its mother bathes and brushes out her hair. I want to sip my aging mother's tea to test the heat before I slide it into her arthritic hand. I want to wake up afterward. I want to wake up brave again. I want to touch you in the simple way we stroke sweat from cold bottles pluck eyelashes from each other's cheeks, and make a wish. Thank you again for listening and for having me, and my greatest wish for each of you is that you stay safe, and I hope to see you and hug you hard when this is over. Thanks. Kelly Harris received her MFA in Creative Writing from Lesley University and has received fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center and Kavi Khan. In 2017, she presented Black Love, a sustaining force post-Katrina at the National Symposium celebrating the 80th anniversary of Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. In 2018, a portion of a research on Louisiana's first African-American poet laureate, Pinky Gordon Lane, was published by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. She is the New Orleans Literary Coordinator for Poets and Writers. And Kelly's first book, Freedom Knows My Name, is set for release in spring 2020. Hi, my name is Kelly Harris DeBerry. And it is my pleasure to join you for the Just Listen to Yourself Louisiana Poetry Series during 
this national quarantine. I hope that you are well. I hope that you are safe. And I hope you enjoy these poems. I'm going to begin with a poem inspired by my second grader. I was picking my daughter up from school and it was considered a very cold day in New Orleans. And I grew up in the North, <clears throat> uh, in the lake effect. So I know cold. So I always say that Southern cold is much more bearable than anything that I experienced growing up. So my daughter is going on and on and on about how cold it is. And she says, what if it drops to zero degrees? I'm gonna need like 45 coats. And I'm like, really, really? And so I just kind of give her a side eye. And as we're walking, the poem hits me. And so this is called 45 Colts. If you're walking after school and it's zero degrees cold, you might need 45 coats or a warmer country that fits more like glove than noose over a hooded sweet tooth boy. I know I told you Find an adult if there's danger. Scratch that. This is America. Should have layered you long ago when the wind chill was Jim Crow and church bombs. Needed 45 coats then. Now to cover the piles of abandoned black bodies from Flint to New Orleans. Need 45 coats to bulletproof the days. Patch holes in the cheese and the ham sandwich to lure the rats. This cold-blooded government feels like Russia's winter. 45 coats, not weather report exactly. More like forecasts, snowflakes, white tears, bullying neighbors for the right to rage. See what I mean? 45 coats gathered like clan in red hats, pressed like monsters against windows, giving snakes chills, hell freezing over. 45 coats to walk this slippery democracy, soften the fall, make angels of our ordinary selves. Need 45 coats for the days we shiver at headlines and bank accounts. 45 coats like books on your back, 45 coats and counting, survival math, a science. How long does it take a nation to thaw? Wish we were talking the same temperature, but I'll keep this 100. You need 45 coats, a shovel for the lies, a freedom in the wind, a president without icicles hanging from his tongue, blades in his breath, need 45 coats that zip all the way up like a fence. Guard your skin with room to breathe. Imagine putting on America, wearing a country without a snag. Uh, this next poem is called, It's a Girl. And it's from my upcoming book called, Freedom Knows My Name. It's a girl, and girl, let me tell you how they wanted you, a boy, to carry your father's name. The running joke is boys are easier to straighten out than boy crazy girls. Poor dad, they said, rubbing his back as if you are the pain coming up his legs. Keep trying for a boy, a junior, a son. Every man wants one to shine like a car, keep pace with the globe of men racing to show off their flags in the earth. And it's the women too with wives tales for making boys and satisfied men. Hurry, deliver that man a boy as if I should return you like a shirt or a toaster, pop out a different ball of human. Oh girl, they would have made you an asterisk, put me to work on my back again. 
just to see a boy win. Um, I mentioned that Freedom Knows My Name is the title of my upcoming book that should be out um, no later than June this year. Um, so I thank you all in advance for um, your support. So this next poem is called Push It and See What Happens After Salt and Pepper. <laughs> Never could I moan, ooh, baby, 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 baby like those fleshy women rolling their backs into breathlessness. Under this roof, there was God watching my mother, watching me. Lovers dance, but not in girls' bodies. My parents, a one-way door, the Jesus way, sealed the music shut against boys and babies coming too soon. A girl's reputation feathers her future. I was not going to be a fast tail girl with a leather attitude, back talking in red lipstick and jungle earrings. All the wild I could have been never left my body. Always house rules chained around my neck. Always the heaviest gold. Um, this next poem is called For the Women Who Saved Me, and it's dedicated to all the women in my life who have helped me along my journey, took care of me. Um, I thank you, and this is for them. For the women who saved me and pulled me up for air, covering me in blankets of honey, setting my table with a vase of mirth, bringing fruit baskets and soup to the lips of my children. They come through doors made from long ago intuition, daughtering me like their own. The women come knowing the scent of hard times, grating worry into my bowls, shaping meals by hand. The women come ready washing loads of my business, folding me back into place. These women, stiff lovers, demand my sorrow on polished silver. They come disciples of their mothers, grandmothers, field workers, shucking tears like corn, pressing my hard head into pearl. The women come in the rain after work, in the midnight to rock my regret to sleep. They come fussy and broken, washing my face with compassion, patching my heartbreak with laughter, guarding my name with candlelight. They come barefoot, conjuring ancestors with Yoruba songs and oiled blessings. The women come in dreams and flesh, and as pregnant armies loaded with grenades of love and sharp, warm eyes filled with visions of women saving themselves. Um, this poem is called Super Sunday, New Orleans. Black people, ordinary royalty, crown themselves in bold-faced streets, tip their heads back into unpredictable skies, dance between bad days and bright feathers, gold teeth, sweaty women, squat low and nest on this unbreakable city, burdens laid down under the bridge, on a porch, on a rooftop is how you fly away for a moment. A lifetime, trumpets and trombones point back at God. This is the sound of the people who came through bloody waters, afloat with faith and ancient drums, dancing to remember how to unchain the body, return it to the sea of freedom. Look at this Sunday, unspeakable joy, all the glory, all the footwork. My last poem is called, Sometimes 
life changes its mind. And as we go through this time of the coronavirus, we are learning that life um, sometimes takes turns and detours. Sometimes life changes its mind. Sometimes life changes its mind, lays out a different dress, and there you are, a woman, putting on a different world, everything you might have been pulled from under your feet. You are still standing, but not in the same place. Lost is what I say, far from home is what I mean. There is no language for walking a long road that leads to nowhere. In each hand, you carry a suitcase of time, yearning for livable answers, a way around mountains, mama's cooking, homemade loving. Sometimes life changes its mind and what it wants for dinner. Has your tongue ever trembled at the spoon of medicine aiming at your mouth? You tell yourself, swallow this life for your own good, open and push the cruel taste past resistance because life changes its mind, gives you another dose, another lesson about how words and wishes travel far out into the sea, leaving you with no choice except to stick your neck out against the current and make peace with the wind. Thank you. David Havard is the author of two collections of poems, Map Home, published in 2013, and Penelope's Design, a chapbook published in 2010. David's new book, Weathering, published in 2020 by Mercer University Press, is a chimeric omnibus of poetry and memoir. He taught for 30 years at Centenary College of Louisiana and currently lives in Shreveport. Thank you, John Warner Smith, for the opportunity to participate in this celebration of National Poetry Month. Thanks also to Robert Wilson, whose technological wizardry is making it possible online. I'm going to read three poems from my new book, Weathering, Poems and Recollections. It was published in February by Mercer University Press. <laughs> I'm going to start with an adolescent adventure. A former student of mine told me that this poem was about fidelity. That's not what I would have said, but she was a brilliant student. Perhaps she's right. The title of the poem is Molting. Before dawn even, I'm zipping past the exit to Myrtle Beach. That's where my girlfriend was, who had a summer job there, singing. But I was heading north to see Janet. Hot and muggy, the weather changed at Richmond to rainy, not with a torrent of blades, but a drizzle of pins and chilly. I had to borrow a flannel shirt from Janet, a man's, which fit me. Janet was renting, along with her college roommate and one other girl, a townhouse in Georgetown. Sometimes, while they were at work, I'd venture afield to a gallery, Corcoran, Phillips. Mostly I browsed the neighborhood bookstores and otherwise loitered. I had to ask the girls, because I was getting so many probing looks from guys, if maybe I had an effeminate manner. You have, she said, the matronly one whose name escapes me. Just a nice face. I slept on the living room sofa, sunburned, itching like mad. I'd scroll the peeling skin off my shoulders and roll it into a little ball, then flick it. Overhead, 
the women were getting ready to be, for bed, their heels conveying thunder, while I read by lamplight a poem in Harper's by Robert Penn Warren, whom Janet and I and her housemate Felicia had met. A problem in spatial composition in which a hawk, like something divine, unseen above a window-framed vista composed of a stone scarp and forest, at sunset enters the frame as if from forever, only to go in an eye blink. My wife, who was then my girlfriend, who sang at the beach where noontide had blistered my shoulders, my wife says it's all about sex. Not Warren's poem, this story of mine. The thunder, having slung flimsy bras across the shower rod, puts up its feet. The women nesting. Molting, I clasp the neck of that shirt, whoever's it is, which I'll shake out in the morning. The weather whistles past window sills and under the door. And though it sings like blades cold steel, I picture within the lamplight's moon on the ceiling, a hawk whose shrills are high noons killing rain. My wife, who was my girlfriend then, she and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary four years ago in Greece. Every evening we'd walk along the bay to a church that sat on a finger of rock out in the bay. One windy evening there was a wedding. The title of this poem is Wedding Wind. Wedding wind. Beyond the pines which hid, except for the chimney, a closed off season beachside taverna. From up on the slope where relics ourselves we lodged in a derelict windmill, the blue looked firm enough to float a rock without a ripple of worry. Even so, my gaze as though white robed, a savior skimmed to the boat in the cove, then stepped from the solid blue of the bay to shelves of bluer schist, a pilgrim, on up to the whitewashed church on its finger of rock, to exchange with the icon, a kiss for a healing look from the virgin. Wind by evening. We took our sunset walk around the wind-chopped cove, the sailboat pitching cove, along the cliffside path, despite not only the wind, but also the crowd thronging the church. A wedding, yes. Among the dusty cars that choked the lot was one in a wind-whipped frenzy of streamers. The spirit aroused, of course, in us a vision of ours. By tune, electric guitars were yowling, the pines, were they dancing with wind or light from the woken taverna? The wind swelled with the odor of meat fat sizzling on coals. The taverna was smoking. Or wasn't it thunder that shook us? That fiendish, vibrating bass and cats. The feral ones fed by our landlord to battle the vipers, serpents of lightning in bed as though on board. We drowsily hoisted a sail too suddenly pregnant with wind. Our rope burned hands like urgent semaphores, like creaking blades up on the slope, conducting the wind. I'm recording this video on Sunday, April 19th which happens to be Easter Sunday in Greece. Maybe this last poem, set on the same Greek island as Wedding Wind, is an Easter poem. It also depicts a change of weather. The title is Upon This Rock. 
upon this rock. Two days of it, wind from Africa, shoving the sea from its bed. The Sahara erased the horizon, hazed the islands from view. But now, across a bay as blue as it is calm, as blue as the churches are white, on the tip of each of two narrow peninsulas, gleamingly white, across the shimmering bay, a fishing boat putters. Over my shoulder, a dove coos. Farther inland, the bells of the blue-domed basilica toll. Call and response. When next, from down below, from somewhere amid the stand of pines between this place and the shoreline, a rooster crows, I go in my mind, I shoulder my way, head down, again I am butting my way through the wind to the edge of the cliff. Wind steepened waves a crown, and wind torn wisps like tatting, the sea a god's bulk. Bursting against the face of the cliff, the depths like batting up through a hole in a boulder, exploding. Hearing the rooster, I picture the rock hawking the sea from its throat. I think of the fisherman Peter erupting with curses, in agony, crowing. Thanks. Brad Richard is the author of four collections of poetry, Habitations, Motion Studies, Butcher's Sugar, and Parasite Kingdom, winner of the 2018 10th Gate Prize from The Word Works. He lives and writes in New Orleans, where he taught talented high school students for 28 years. Hi, I'm Brad Richard. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of the Louisiana State Library's National Poetry Month celebration. I'm grateful to John Warner Smith for inviting me to participate and to Jim Davis and everyone else at the State Library. I'm going to be reading just a few poems from my most recent book, Parasite Kingdom. The first poem I'm going to read is called Fear. It was the first poem I wrote that ended up becoming part of this book, and I think it will give you a sense of the territory that you're in. Fear. One morning, fear was a little kingdom inhabited by flags and burnt matchsticks and me, scuttling down cratered avenues to the library, where my job was making sense of what was left of the world. Our king sulked in a dim corner, pretending to read old magazines, eluding for now the grip on his shoulder, the usurping voice. Time's up, your highness. The librarian will put these away. I bowed. He nodded. His thin lips made me think of the one-armed girl eating dirt in the square. The day was hot. The building stank. Decades of pigeons roosting and dying in the attic had tainted stacks of diaries, histories, novels, atlases, and lexicons of extinct empires. I, their final guardian, our king, the relic and oracle of uncatalogued silences suffered and stored. Dust shook down. Windows rattled as tanks groaned in the street open-mouthed, staring like a boy scout stripped of his badges. The king let me lead him to a basement table and give him my pocket knife and a carton of unreckoned contents of his regime. As I dragged more cartons from the shadows, he slid open files and envelopes, studied photographs of people with amputated names, transcribed tapes of a woman whispering in a closet, scraped samples from crumbling confessions, scanned columns of numbers and burned them and sniffed their smoke, nodded in a trance, his gaze so rapt, I bent my ear close to his lips, hoping for a hint. A shell burst above us, a shadow whimpered behind me. 
He cowered as boots pounded down the stairs, and I was glad to snatch my knife away, glad to point to his dank little uniform, glad to let them open the ledger of my body, to feel their bayonets inscribe me with their cleansing lies. So, that's where we are. Um, this kingdom is involved in a war. It seems to be a civil war. It also seems to involve other entities. Um, one of those important entities is the king's nemesis, who is a mythically gigantic blue wasp who lives in a burrow beneath the palace. Um, you're going to get a little bit of the wasp in what I'm going to read you, but, um, Considering that this is Poetry Month and that this is a library event, I thought I would read a poem called A Cento of the Garbage Batch. And you may know a cento is a poetic form in which you only use lines from other poets' work. Um, I have kind of bent the rules. So um, for one thing, I've distorted some of the source material. Um, and my source material isn't just poetry. Some of it is also like online articles and Wikipedia pages. Um, one of my sources is the old English poem, The Seafarer. And um, I, just, the, the, I just use the old English in the poem. And that is that line is Hungor inen slat medavergis mod. My apologies for my pronunciation. Um, roughly translated, it means a hunger tears from within the sea weary soul. A cento of the garbage patch, dedicated to Captain Charles Moore. Nurdle, a plastic pellet, raw material of production or ground down from larger chunks of waterborne mermaid tears. Much have I traveled in the plastic stew. It is not down on any map. True places never are. Twice five miles of nurdle ground, twice the size of Texas, a slow, deep, clockwise swirling vortex of air and water turning, turning in the widening North Pacific subtropical gyre. Japan. San Francisco. Now, from all parts, the swelling nanfills flow and bear their nurdles with them. Sweepings from cities and ships, junk, nets, ropes, bottles, motor oil jugs, cracked bath toys, drowned turtles, plastic, stinking sprats, plastic, dead birds, and ketchup caps come tumbling down the flood. You cannot stand in the middle of this, like stout Cortez, when with seagull eyes he stared at the Pacific, the sea, a collector, quick to return, a rapacious look. Look there, look there. Oh, my Atlantic of the cracked shores, are you too? 25% of our planet, a toilet that never flushes. Hungor in and slat medvergus mot, and so it piled up to the ceiling. It filled the, it, the floor. It cracked the, blocked the door. At last, the garbage reached so. Final, touch, sky. We borrowed a wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater, but then, of course, it was too late. What? No life, Nurdle. Nurdle, 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 shored against my ruin, the magnanimity of the sea, which will permit no records. Much of the book is narrated by anonymous citizens who um, are just coping with living in this world, this world that is uh, way too much like our own. Um, so I'm going to read two more poems um, from those anonymous voices. And the first one is a poem called Toilet Paper. Toilet Paper. I go down to the basement to grab a roll of toilet paper from the shelf, 
but there isn't any, and where the shelf had stood, the wall is wide open. Inside, a uniformed man sits at a desk, lamp lit, its top littered with paper, regular paper, the kind you write with. There's a chair. The man gestures toward it, so I obey and sit. The man shuffles some papers, chooses one, and hands it to me, asking, Did you write this? Being a writer, I'm curious to know if it is, in fact, my work, so I take it and try to read it, but the words tell bloody fantasies of regicide, slaughter, revenge, I hand it back. No, I could never write that. Besides, we have a president, not a king. The man points at the page. I lean in to see my name, my signature. The man slides the sheet in a folder, closes it. What were you looking for when you came down here? I squirm, clench my anus shut. It's personal. His cheap deodorant reeks, mingles with the basement's mildew and nauseous. Do you have, what's it called, a warrant? The man sighs, removes his glasses, rubs his eyes. I didn't come to take anything or arrest you. I came to ask if you know your name is on all of these. He gestures across the desk. Behind me, the wall closes. I hear someone walk down the basement stairs, hear the plastic crackle as someone takes a roll from the package and walks back upstairs to have, I'm sure, a normal hygienic shit while I'm stuck reading, ashamed of my filth, while the man watches. The last poem I'm going to read is actually the last poem in the book. It's called Homecoming. A little bit long, but it actually goes pretty fast. Um... So, as you'll see at the end, uh, the war is over. Um, but what kind of world are we left with? Homecoming. One. Finally, the war was over and we could go home, but my wife was wary. Those houses, she said, watching the news, those stores, schools, police, fake. Don't believe what you see. Childhood. Wasps twitching on honey cakes, and our game with the clay balls, hiding them under the house. What was it called? I phoned my brother. He couldn't remember. He wasn't going back. You hear it's hell, they're starving. Then such progress, it's amazing. Who cares anymore? Let me be unhappy where I am. A neighbor who'd helped us when we immigrated flew back to check on family property. Weeks later, I saw her in the shade on her porch, drinking tea. How was it? How long should we wait? Her skin had darkened, not tanned, more like it came from inside her. Wait a year, five, ten, by then, who knows? Maybe everywhere will be like that. Two. Everything looked too new. Ruins all raised and dumped, the palace, a museum and shops, the square, a civic theater. The supermarket was like a supermarket, but the food tasted like imitations of food we knew. The library gates were locked, under renovation, opening soon. Of course, our old house was gone. Our new one was fine, familiar, like the food. The power went out or we had no water for hours, sometimes all day. It's just how things are here, said our new neighbors. We tried making friends, but their chatter and ours sounded like a script. We watched a lot of TV. Scientists urged us to be vigilant about eradicating invasive species. Three, call your brother and ask him to send some real toothpaste. My wife spat in the sink, cupped her hand under the faucet, caught the thin, cloudy stream. My brother didn't answer. No message. Toothpaste. I just couldn't say it. That night at the Civic Theater, we saw a folk play. No story, just symbols, an iron eagle with a red tongue, iron bars for fingers, wingtips curled into blunt iron fists, and phrases sung by a children's chorus. Wings of peace, bird of hope. When we came home, the street was dark. My wife found her flashlight and led the way. Oh my God, she said, look. The beam lit a heap of dark husks in a mound on the seat of my reading chair. Wasps, I said. They must have nested in the walls. I wonder what killed them. 
My wife was grabbing garbage bags and handed me the broom, more mounds on the dining table and the laundry basket on the bathroom scale in our bed. She held the flashlight. I swept the bodies. In the morning, bags were heaped in front of every house on the block. Four. Now the power and water have stopped for good. We left coffee cans in the yard, hoping to catch rain. One day, packs of batteries and cases of bottled water showed up. My wife twisted off a cap, sipped, fake, even the water. At night, people come out to scavenge. We hear them rustling in our garden. Days, my wife shuts the door to her room, stays there reading the same books she brought with her. Well, I've been working in the basement ever since I dropped a wrench on the concrete floor and heard under the clang a muffled echo. I took a mallet, tapped lightly, heard it again, a buried breath. I heaved the mallet, cracked the slab, pried chunks away and found the burrow someone had started, the shovel they'd left. It feels good digging, aiming into the dark, feeling it resist, breaking it down, shoulders sore, back sore. It feels like it means something, this rhythm of blade into dirt calling, come home, come home. You're almost there. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day. Donnie Rose is a poet teaching artists, essayists, and community activists from Baton Rouge. He's the creator of the American Audit, a multimedia spoken word project detailing 400 years of Black American life using the extended metaphor of America as a business being audited. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in marketing from Southern University in Baton Rouge. He is a 2018-2019 Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellow. Donnie's work as a performance poet writer has been featured in a variety of publications. He also works as a contributing writer for the North Star. Hey y'all, this is Donnie Rose, and I'm excited to be a part of Louisiana State Poet Laureate uh, John Warner Smith's Listen to Yourself event. Um, that we're doing for you all virtually. So, I have a few poems that I would like to share with you all that I actually have, uh, actually wrote throughout the course of this month, National Poetry Month. Um, I started on a challenge that I called Viral Voices, in which I was writing persona poems and the voices of various identities related to COVID-19. Um, for anyone who is familiar with the persona poem format, it is poems written in the voice of someone or something else. And so uh, I have a few of those pieces I wanna share with you all and hopefully you enjoy. So again, all of these poems are written in the voices of varying identities of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Most of it is objects, some may be people or animals. So the first piece I wanna share, the title is the N95 mask suffers an identity crisis. Again, the title is The N95 mask suffers an identity crisis. I can no longer recognize the mask in the mirror or the body contorting itself to fit so many changing faces. I did not sign up to be wartime defense. The cries of anguish are so piercing and I'm not shield enough to barricade the ambush of droplets launching from the mouths of the suffering or the screams for ceasefire from the same civilians refusing to stay off the battleground until the white flag can replace the white sheep. Next poem, a death certificate list all of its most well-known identities while filling out the census amidst the pandemic. Once again, a death certificate lists all of its most well-known identities while filling out the census amidst the pandemic. 
slave, Negro, colored, Afro-American, black, African-American, stolen legacy, gone too soon, gone too soon, junior, gone too soon, the third, displaced, American guinea pig, non-essential human. All right, I'm gonna lighten the mood up a little bit with the next piece, which is called, Alexa announces a list of songs they won't play no matter how many times said songs are requested. Again, Alexa announces a list of songs they won't play no matter how many times said songs are requested. Alexa, play, I'm sorry, the following songs are unavailable right now. Let's stay together. Touch me, tease me. We belong together. Kissing you. I want to get next to you. Come close. I would die for you. I get around. Breathe and stop. Love in this club. Just a closer walk with thee. Alexa playing back back. Back back. Give me 50 feet. Next poem. The Easter Bunny finds out why all the egg hunts have been moved inside. Once again, the Easter Bunny finds out why all the egg hunts have been moved inside. Here I was emerging from the rabbit hole I always fall into in search of fresh faces and pastel colors and lo and behold, I could not hear a joyful scream for miles. I searched the skies for signs of downpour but did not find any traces of overcast. So. I hopped on down to the craft store, hunting for acrylic paint and the sign outside read close. And there was a pattern of closure for blocks. And I asked myself, if all the kids were on punishment, then I grabbed a copy of the local paper and found out they all indeed were. So, I got one more poem from this series that I will share with you all. And uh, since I have some time, I'll probably get into a few other poems that I've written in the past. So the last one from the Viral Voices series that I will share right now. A ventilator whispers an adapted version of the serenity prayer. Once again. A ventilator whispers an adapted version of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the empathy to dignify the bodies that will slip beyond my grasp. The courage to continue breathing life into lungs able to unseal and the wisdom to know the difference between your will and the failure of men who will rename their negligence divine order. Amen. So yeah, those were just a collection of poems that I wrote uh, throughout the course of the month. Typically during National Poetry Month, a lot of poets look to write uh, 30 poems within 30 days. I got to day 13 and then I fell off the wagon and I never got back on it. But I think that I got some pretty good content out of the time of those 13 days. So don't want to necessarily rush it. Um, and I do encourage a lot of uh, writers and poets and particularly young poets um, work your craft but don't necessarily force your craft so if it gets to a point where the writing feels like too much of a burden then you may want to step away from it for a minute so for me I had to come to the realization that even though I did not go through all 30 days of the month with poems I got a good 13 poems out of it and so you just heard six of them um, I'll uh, do a few more poems from an earlier collection or earlier collections of work. Here we go. Sometimes the recipient of the bullet's outrage does not make the headline news. Ask the ditches, the ravines, the alleys, 
any piece of land that has served as an accomplice to the kill. Sometimes the dark slips into the dark as anonymously as it walked the light of day. And when a black boy is killed, the conversation that hovers over his lifeless body often is about everything except his right to remain breathing. He's buried twice, once beneath the soil, once beneath everyone else's agenda. And the preacher said, come to Jesus while the blood is still running warm in your veins. And the blood said, when my skin spreads the pavement, I don't feel warm, I'm at my boiling point. And Jesus said, woolly-haired, bronze-skinned twin, I see they have not stopped crucifying those who they don't quite understand. And the soloist said, precious Lord, take my hand. And the mother of the dead black boy said, Phew. and the cop said, you reach, I teach. But the block said, he just wanted to go home. And the cop's gun said, I need to request some time off. And the bullet said, all these frequent flyer miles, and I always seem to travel to dark destinations, no matter the time of day. And the church folks said, amen, because saying how the hell would have been considered sinful. And sin said, your skin is always my alibi. And the casket said, son, I was molded in your image. And the father of the dead black boy said, Lord, why not me? And the news reporter said the victim was caught stealing just last week. And the grim reaper grinned and said, that boy was a petty thief at best. I can show you a thing or two about taking things and the usher said, God's got him now. And the floorboards wept, and the pews collapsed, and the painting of Caesar Borgia smirked, and the dead black boy said. Once again, my name is Donnie Rose, and I would like to thank you all for listening and engaging with uh, a time to listen. Thanks again to our poet laureate, John Warner Smith. You all stay safe, stay distant. Thank you for listening. And my thanks especially to all the wonderfully talented poets who read.